America for the people, fighting to continue to strengthen the economy, lower costs, create millions of good paying jobs. It's a good day because it is the one year anniversary of the American Rescue Plan, a transformative piece of legislation that saved the economy and set us off on a trajectory where 7.4 million jobs were created during the first 13 months of President Biden's presidency. Fastest rate of economic growth in 40 years. Unemployment at pre-pandemic lows of 3.8%. And so we're thankful that President Biden, House Democrats led by Speaker Pelosi and Senate Democrats were able to come together, pass this transformative piece of legislation and set us off on a course where we're continuing to make progress for the American people. Still have challenges that we are working to resolve, but making progress for the American people. And lastly, it's a good day because we're gonna hear from President Joe Biden as he articulates his continuing vision for lifting up everyday Americans, for lowering costs, making their lives the best that it can possibly be, ensuring that we can in every single zip code across America have opportunity and prosperity and that the American people can pursue that great American dream. So it's another good day. And now it's my honor uh, to yield to our dynamic, amazing, <laughs> wonderful, as she would say about others, but I'm saying about her fabulous speaker, Nancy <laughs> D'Alessandro Pelosi. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we, let me just say, I just left an occasion uh, where we started off by saying, Slava Ukraini. So much of what we talked about last night was about the Ukraine. So much of what we have been uh, addressing has been about Ukraine. And I'm so pleased that the president will be announcing soon, it's in the public domain already, so I, I don't uh, preempt him. Uh, the uh, lifting of most favored nation status, now known as normal trade relations with Russia, joining with our allies in doing so. Very proud that in a very bi strong bipartisan way, we took action in the House uh, this week to lift the purchase of, of um, Russian oil and have the Magnitsky uh, bill part, legislation part of that, uh, renewing that law. And then today, we'll go further. I want to commend the president for his extraordinary leadership. Uh, the, I just say this, when I was in school, and some of you have heard me say this, I was at the Kennedy inauguration. And he said, everybody knows, it's citizens of America, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. The very next sentence that he said is what hit me hard and was, and I'll, I'll never forget it, it's to the citizens of the world, ask not what America can do for you, but what we can do working together for the freedom of mankind. Joe Biden is exemplifying that working together for the freedom of mankind. We look forward to seeing him today. And when we do, we will congratulate him on his leadership in passing the American Rescue uh, Package. This plan, this is something that was not only help people survive from COVID, not only help try to have them reach their success, was transformational in how they do so. And we want to continue that work in certain aspects of BBB or child tax credit, uh, universal pre-K, the, the list goes on, ch affordable child care, our champion in the Congress, Catherine Clark, uh, nobody has done more than she has in the Congress on that subject. Uh, home health care, saving our planet, the list goes on. We're very proud of our president, of what we did in these two days. And I thank Chairman uh, Jeffries and Vice Chair Aguilar and Catherine, who was very much a part of this, uh, for the magnificent intellectual resources they brought together here on subjects that relate to jobs, women in the workplace, saving our planet. The, the list goes on and on. Very successful as we hone our message so that we can uh, win the election. With that, I'm very pleased to yield to our distinguished um, uh, 
I don't want to say Democrat, House Majority Leader, our Democratic Majority Leader, Steny Hoyer. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and thank you very much, uh, Hakeem Jeffries and Pete Aguilar. Um, we got out late uh, Thursday or early Friday morning, uh, and I think everybody was sort of wondering, how is this going to go? And we call it a retreat, but I call it a resolving that we will continue to work on behalf of the people. Uh, that resolve was uh, strengthened by the positive nature of what Sean Maloney is going to tell you in a short time, but also by the panelists that we heard, uh, focused on how we reach out, make policies for the people to lift them up. And very frankly, uh, the American people in this country and the world received a gut punch from the pandemic. And we have responded with vigor and with effectiveness to that gut punch, which is why we are uh, confronting an economy that is one of the fastest growing economies that we've seen in many decades. Uh, we mentioned uh, the number of people employed at 7.4 or 5 or 6 million people. That's in the context of in the previous four years prior to the Biden administration losing 2.2 million jobs in America. What an extraordinary turnaround. Uh, unemployment now down uh, 4% and lower. Uh, we come to Philadelphia, the birth of our democracy, to say that we are going to renew our resolve to build this democracy even stronger. And now the Ukrainian people and the world has received a gut punch and the world led by Joe Biden is responding, responding in a way that has given the Ukrainians the courage and the resolve themselves to confront an overwhelming show of force uh, by the criminal activity of the Russian army under Vladimir Putin. And I know that I speak for all of our uh, caucus saying that we are not going to flag in our commitment to making sure that the American people and the global community uh, stays together and lifts ourselves up. I know the president of the United States is going to come here and has empathy for the American people because they're being challenged by inflation. And yes, he said in the State of the Union, we're going to bring those costs down and we're going to continue to fight for the Competes Act. We're going to continue to find the Build Back Better Act. And I hope all of you have noticed in this Congress over the last 18 months, the unity of purpose and actions of the Democratic Party for the people. I now yield to the whip um, from South Carolina, an extraordinary leader. Uh, a great civil rights leader uh, and a leader for the people, the gentleman from South Carolina, Jim Clyburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Leader, Madam Speaker, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chair, Assistant Speaker, Chairman. The Speaker often quotes from that little pamphlet, The Crisis, written by Thomas Paine when she others the times have found us. I tend to go to another portion of that little pamphlet when I'm trying to gather the challenges before us. And if you remember, Thomas Paine wrote that pamphlet when we were trying to give birth to this great country. And he said in that pamphlet that these are times that try men's souls. I can think of no other time in my life when we have really been faced with real trials. When we look at what's happening around the world, the war that we all have emotionally attached ourselves to, the challenges that we've had coming back from COVID-19, and the future for our children, our grandchildren, these are times that try men's souls. But what I'm pleased with is the fact that these people that I'm standing with, these people we're meeting with, are not summer soldiers. They're not sunshine patriots. They are measuring up to these times. 
And I think that when we leave this retreat or whatever study we wish to call it, <laughs> we are going to rededicate ourselves to making this country and all of its greatness accessible and affordable for all of its citizens. And with that, I'm pleased to yield to Assistant Leader Catherine Clark. Thank you so much, Mr. Whip. It is so good to be here with Speaker Pelosi, Majority Leader Hoyer, our DCCC Chair, and a special congratulations to Chairman Hakeem Jeffries and Vice Chairman Pete Aguilar for truly bringing together an incredible issues conference under tough circumstances, and we, we appreciate it. And as we stand here today, on this anniversary of the American Rescue Plan and anticipating a visit and words from our president. It really is about a focus on the American family. And that is what we have heard throughout this conference, reaffirming that this is not about Wall Street, it's about Main Street. It's about rebuilding our schools, not prisons. It's about making sure that we put the American family and how they meet this time of great challenge with great progress. And that's exactly what the American Rescue Plan did. And I can tell you, as I travel around my district and meet with families that are now saving money on their health care because we allowed them to expand those healthcare options, who are saving money on their energy bills because of the weatherization programs we put into place. The child care providers and the moms who saw a collapse of a system of care that they need to get to work. And there won't be an economic recovery without women in this economy they are seeing that $40 billion that was in the American Rescue Plan come to work and make that connection. We see the American people, we see the American family, and they are our priority. And this agenda came out of conversations that President Biden had with Americans across our great nation. And we are going to meet this time of historic challenge with historic progress, because that is what we are determined to do. It is not going to be easy. We are going to keep on pushing to lower costs for American families and to build an economy where everyone can see themselves in it. That is the promise of the American Rescue Plan. That is the promise of the work that lies ahead for us. And that is our promise to the American people. And it is my, now my great pleasure to welcome Vice Chair Pete Aguilar. Thank you, Assistant Speaker Clark. And I thank my colleagues and, and join them uh, in celebrating and honoring uh, the anniversary of the American Rescue Plan. When the president was inaugurated, there was no infrastructure to deliver the vaccines. Over 200 million shots in arms, making sure that we pave the way to reopen schools, support small business. Those are the items that are important in our districts. Those are the pieces that are important in our, in our communities. Making sure that we reopen schools. 46% of schools were closed when the president took office. 99% of schools are open now. 11 million people unemployed. The president has helped with House Democrats create 7 million jobs. Those are the tangible efforts that we can do together. And we have been partners in that progress. And so we appreciate the president continuing to, to meet with us, uh, continuing to um, uh, work with us and uh, give us updates and join us as partners as we deliver for the American public. That is what we are focused on, uh, whether it is a, a, a retreat or any other setting. Uh, we are we are partners in this progress with the president, and we appreciate uh, him him coming and uh, and joining in us with us. Uh, with that, I will uh, yield to the D Triple C Chairman Sean Patrick Maloney. Well, I echo the thanks to uh, Cox Chair Jeffries and Vice Chair Aguilar, to the Speaker and the leaders. Uh, I will just say we come to Philadelphia with a record of results and a plan for the future. Uh, the Republicans have a ploy to win back power, and that's the difference. 
We have a vision for America, and all of you are part of it. There's room in, in, in our America for uh, every one of you and your families. And we are building that future every day. The speaker quoted John Kennedy. I, I was thinking of his famous speech about the Apollo program when he said, we choose to go to the moon and do the other things, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. We're doing hard things, and it takes hard work and great leadership, which we are blessed with. But we round the bend on the halfway mark of this term with a record we're proud of, with a list of work to do, with the strongest economic growth in 35 years, with hundreds of millions of shots in arms and a pandemic that's ending, with 550 bills passed the House and 90 signed into the law, into law by the president. We're proud of that record. We're happy to stack it up against the other team's absence of a vision. And we have incumbents and candidates who can win in tough districts. Uh, and I look forward to the rest of this year to continue to do this work. And our argument will be that if you give us another two years, we'll keep working for you and your family. The other side will keep working for themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Thank you to all the members of the leadership. Questions? And we'll have a few moments because we are scheduled to get started uh, with our issues conference day three today. Go right to the back. Well, I'm going to yield to but, uh, Ms. Kyber and Mr. Aguilar have spoken during the course of the weekend on um, what weekend, whatever it is, whatever day it is, as you <laughs> <start out. laughs> the issue is confidence. Cross off the word retreat. We do not retreat. <laughs> Mr. Kyber and Mr. Aguilar. Well, I thank everybody that's pretty familiar. Uh, with my feelings on that subject. And I think uh, I have um, pretty good reasons to be very positive about executive action. But what I like to say to people, if we review our history as a country, great country, often, more often than not, we see great leadership in our executive showing the Congress the way to go before Congress could ever act on the institution of slavery. Abraham Lincoln used the executive order uh, and that's what the Emancipation Proclamation was. And the country followed some two years later, what, three years after he signed the order. And I think you will find that down through history. And so uh, Pete and I were very, strong believers that sometimes the Congress, the people need to be nudged by the person we've chosen to lead. And so we believe uh, that a whole lot can be kickstarted, not in the end, because we know executive authors end with the presidency uh, uh, of whoever signs it. So they can be kickstarted and so several of us have been encouraging the president uh, to do the significant research as necessary and to use that method to help kickstart uh, a recovery, not just from COVID, but from some negative, or should I say adverse Supreme Court decisions when it comes to voting, uh, as well as uh, other things that people are very, very emotionally attached to. We're always concerned about how that's why we're asking uh, for the research to be done because our frontliners too. I don't know of a single person in the United States of America who want to see their votes nullify. If you've got legislatures setting up procedures by which they can nullify the activity of the voters, nobody wants to see that. So nullification, interposition, 
These are things that Martin Luther King Jr. spoke about very eloquently, but we're experiencing today. And I don't know that frontliners will want to expose themselves to a campaign and have their supporters' votes nullified. I'll just say briefly, and you heard yesterday from, from Chairman Ruiz uh, when, it, when it comes to this, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus has been a supporter, just like uh, the whip, that sometimes some items deserve executive action. And specifically, when it comes to you know, honoring our commitment uh, as a nation of immigrants, uh, making sure that we stay true uh, to honor the rule of law and to make sure that uh, we are a country that welcomes individuals. Uh, we support uh, TPS for uh, individuals for Ukraine, but we also want to make sure that we have a broader conversation about what we're doing uh, to support uh, immigrants uh, who are fleeing violence, who are fleeing oppression, uh, and who have their lives threatened each and every day. Uh, so we do feel that there is a role for executive action, and, and we plan to have those conversations. We are always mindful. As a former frontliner, I'm always mindful about how our colleagues feel, uh, and we will make sure that we have discussions with our colleagues each and every step of the way uh, to make sure everyone is a part of the discussion uh, moving forward. But there is a role for executive action on so many important topics, like the WHIP said, uh, that affect our country and affect our safety. Yes, I'm happy to address that. But first, I want to quote a Republican president, since I quoted John F. Kennedy, uh, in relationship to executive action. Uh, the last speech that President Reagan made as president of the United States is one that I have referenced in the past with all of you, some of you. But uh, I Google it. You should read it. But just briefly. This is a speech. This was the last speech I will make as president of the United States. I want to communicate a message to a country I love. And he talked about immigration. He talked about immigration and how America's preeminence in the world depended on people constantly coming to our shores, and that the Statue of Liberty was this beacon of hope, and that um, if once if we ever shut that door, we would cease to be preeminent in the world. He said it better and longer. But why I mention it is because when Congress passed the Immigration Bill of 1986, which was none of us, were you in Congress, Denny? Denny was your, <clears throat> which was the last time we had a massive immigration bill. Hmm? Uh, so, so he, um, he didn't, now, Congress passed the bill, and the president said, uh, decided Congress had not gone far enough. So by executive order, he did a family fairness. He expanded what would happen in terms of immigration. George Herbert Walker Bush continued that. And so the, Ronald Reagan, immigration executive order. So there is... Uh, a precedent for that. Well, we, of course, we have a continue to have a need uh, in terms of addressing COVID. The uh, uh, important part of it, as the president has said, and that we have, and we agree, uh, is that um, uh, we have new therapies that can intervene almost immediately, different science, just pills rather than things that have to be frozen, uh, sub, 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 sub zero, and with small, uh, short shelf life. So we have to be able to afford to buy uh, more of these because they intervene early. When they intervene early, uh, they uh, prevent, hope to hopefully prevent the spread. The transmission is where new, new uh, variants come forth. So in, in other words, what we want is no new variant, but we want to be able to address, uh, uh, remedy the situation for those in early stages so that it doesn't uh, take us to a, a, a different place. Uh, what the president was asking for in the legislation was a, a, a good start. It wasn't everything. So we would have needed to do more anyway. And it is... Um, 
and, and we will, and we will, it will be about more funding for those early therapies uh, that we need. And uh, we, we introduced, we're gonna, we were gonna introduce it, uh, was that last night or the night before last, but it got to be the next morning. So we will be introducing the legislation next week. Well, we'll, pro we'll see. Right now, we have already shaped the bill. It's already been um, it's already been uh, approved by the rules committee. So, what we have in the bill there is what we'll go forward with now. Uh, but with the idea uh, that we want more, and really important in all of this is our responsibility to the rest of the world. We all know that unless we're all safe, none of us is safe. And we do have a responsibility to help spread some of these therapies, especially those now that are more easily um, um, sent to countries because, again, uh, they're, they have a longer shelf life and they don't need to be super frozen. Uh, so it, yeah, we can't ignore our responsibilities to the rest of the world, but we also need to honor our responsibilities at home. Well, let me just first not stipulate to your question that it is a retreat, right? That we not eliminate that word. And I feel quite certain that my colleagues will have something to say about this. No, the, the, what we want to do is I began my comments today. My first comments today were about uh, Slava Kwani. This is central to what we're talking about here. People are dying. I spent about 15 minutes with the, uh, you time, they time these things, that's the way it is, with the, uh, President Kerensky uh, day before we came, the day before we came here. Uh, it is central because people are dying. They were bombing a maternity hospital at that time. So uh, there, there's no question that we are paying the attention we need to pay to it. Today, our president will also put forth a request for us to bring to the floor as we prepare to do next week, working in a bipartisan way, hoping to do it under suspension because we have that much support uh, for uh, terminating, the, well, I call it most favorite nation status. They've given it a euphemism, so it doesn't sound so whatever. But no, this is essential. We we have to. We have thirteen billion points, thirteen point six billion dollars in the legislation that we passed a day, but was passed in the Senate yesterday, but passed the day before in our House. So no, we don't. We don't stop what we need to do for America's working families. We have to be strong, and as the president uh, has clearly prioritized. Uh, we need to meet the needs of the American people. We have to save our own democracy, which is under assault in our country. And at the same time, we can honor our responsibilities to, uh, to peace on the world and, and helping all we can. Uh, I'd want to yield to some of my colleagues, though, because I'm sure they'll, uh, your question is sort of global and uh, values and prioritized oriented. Uh, I have every com if I wish you could have seen last night to see I wish you could have seen y'all, but not that much I don't wish you could have seen or, or you'd have been there. <laughs> but perhaps we'll do it again. Sarah Jacobs presided over a um a um a, a moderated conversation with the Secretary of Homeland Security and Secretary former Ambassador Mike uh, Mike McFall. It was fabulous, and it was presided over by Stanley Hoyer, so I'm going to yield to him on that. I just was going to say, one of the major presentations in this uh, conference, this, this renewal of resolve, as I call it, rather than a retreat, 
uh, was about Ukraine. Uh, I spoke about the general broader picture uh, of our responsibility uh, and the threat to our democracy that uh, the Putin criminal invasion of Ukraine uh, presents. Uh, and Sarah Jacobs, who has been involved, she, she's young, she's new, but she's not new to national security. She's not new to conflict resolution. Uh, and uh, Secretary Marokas, who has been given the responsibility by the President of the United States to, from the Homeland Security standpoint, respond and guard against the Russian uh, either uh, cyber security issues, misinformation, uh, involvement in our elections, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, Ambassador McFall, of course, spoke of the Russian psychology, the Russian condition. And he made a very important point uh, that this is Putin's war, not the Russian people's war. Uh, he believes, uh, he said, that they're, the Russian people, if they were given the information, and of course Putin is doing everything he can possible to preclude the Russian people from getting the information of the tragedy and atrocity uh, that is occurring uh, in, in uh, Ukraine. But it was uh, the last thing we did uh, uh, last night and uh, two hours of debate, discussion, and resolve on this issue. And the members. Yeah, the members. A uh, uh, lot of questions asked, a lot of presentation uh, with respect to we need to make sure that we do everything we can uh, short of, of, of risking a world war, uh, which I think there is a consensus that that risk needs to be avoided while at the same time giving all the resources and humanitarian relief to Ukraine that it needs. And very frankly, because the president of the United States and our European allies, which the president has reunited and uh, strengthened their resolve, have done, which is why uh, the courage of the Ukrainian people can be manifested in having slowed down very, very substantially a much, much greater force uh, confronting them. If I may, Stan and I just returned. Well, last weekend we spent down at Selma and Birmingham and Montgomery. And I was absolutely floored when person after person came to me saying, we're all for voting rights, but if you all don't do something to help end this war, there's nothing, there's going to be nothing to vote for. So this is how deep this goes. We're down there for the 57th anniversary of Bloody Sunday, but they were concerned about what we're going to do to stop Putin. Because if we don't, they feel there'll be nothing to vote for. Another question? Yeah, absolutely. I'll yield to the I'll yield to the speaker and majority leader. But you know, throughout our panels, not only member questions about how this impacts our communities, um, but hearing from outside experts, hearing from individuals uh, who uh, who can guide us through this and talk about this. But we are completely mindful about how this impacts. Uh, our communities and our and our country. We're we're thoughtful about it, but we're clear-eyed of what the best policy is going to be, supporting the best policy, supporting our, our president, uh, and making sure that we do everything we can to deliver relief. And that is a continuing conversation about what we can do. But reducing the cost for everyday Americans has been forefront of the Democratic caucus. Uh, it will continue to be a theme that we are going to talk about and develop policy behind. Uh, that's what the leaders behind me have, have focused on, and that's what we're going to continue uh, to champion. Speaker. Uh, I'll, I'll yield to Mr. Clyburn too, but I think this is, you know, a continued conversation. I know that 
Um, Chairman Ruiz indicated that we'll have more to say, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus will have more to say about this topic uh, in the next few weeks, um, but engaging with the White House and, and they know what our requests are. Uh, we've had these these conversations um, and, you know, we'll, we'll keep those, I'm sure the WIP will say, we'll keep those, you know, conversations, you know, amongst friends uh, for now. But at the appropriate time, we do feel that it's important uh, for the president to comment on these and, and for uh, the White House uh, to deliver um, through through executive action if necessary. Speaker and then WIP. I'm fine. I'm fine with that. <laughs> Are you concerned about any Well, legislating is always our our preferred strategy, um, from the speaker to the to the majority leader to to everyone behind me. We know that there is no substitute to developing laws that deliver benefits to to our communities, but we also need partners on the other side of the aisle who are willing to do that. And time and time again, Republicans have not supported. Um, taking action, whether it's delivering voting rights or ensuring that people who call who there is no other country um, uh, that is their home except the United States uh, to ensure that they are protected. So it's our responsibility to make sure that we protect our communities. The Democratic caucus is, is not going to step away from that responsibility uh, and will continue to, to make progress. If I just may, um, I, the Emancipation Proclamation was an executive order. Uh, it was very important for us to have legislative action uh, to get the, de uh, pr the desired effect, what we need to do. Uh, but it's very important uh, to, for the executive to act if we cannot get uh, legislative action immediately. But there's no, in my view, there's no substitute for uh, legislative. Now let me just get back to the question, the larger issue about Putin's tax, that's, a, a, that's really Putin's gas hike. That's his gas hike. This, so much of this uh, increase in the gas tax, uh, gas uh, price started uh, uh, weeks leading up to what happened there. But it, has a, it takes in the context of a larger increase in prices that have different reasons why we have inflation. Inflation sometimes, most frequently, accompanies lower unemployment. Lower unemployment, more inflation. We have to counter it. We have to recognize it, and we have to counter it. Supply chain shortages contribute lower, lower supply, higher cost. We have, to, we have to recognize it, and we have to uh, address it. And one of the things that we talked about yesterday, so we, we, we don't want to give up jobs in order, you know, we, we want lower unemployment. Some, there will be some inflation that comes with that, but we don't want it, it can't be excessive. And all these other things uh, contribute to it. So one of the sessions that we had spent a good deal of time on the, uh, what we call, the American Com uh, Competes Act of 2022. And it is it addresses the need for us to have a big investment in chips so that we have more supply. It addresses, and that's $52 billion, over $40 billion in addressing the supply chain shortages, over $40 billion in, there, in that. And that will go a long way to increasing supply and then reducing the rising costs that go with de decreased supply. And, and the third part of it is uh, investments in education and research and the rest. And that's a place that we're, we're proud of all of it, but we're very proud of that because that comes back to what I started with the earlier, survival, success, transformation. And this bill is transformational in how it not only increases supply to lower inflation, to create jobs, but to do so that has full diversity in how we go forward with education and training and workforce development and all of that. One other point I will make uh, about it is that it, 
what we are doing in our legislation, what we would do in the Build Back Better, 17 Nobel laureates in economics said that that legislation does not increase inflation. It is non-inflationary because of the way it is written. The imprimatur, if you get it, the kiss of death, if you don't, the Joint Tax Committee has said that the BBB would lower, uh, would add a hundred billion dollars so that that is subtracted from the national debt, saves a hundred billion dollars over 10 years. But we have to live in a year where even though the bills for 10 years, they measure it for 20 years and the imprimatur said a trillion dollars over 20 years is saved. So when we're having this discussion, it's important to dispel some of those who say, well, it's the government spending. No, it isn't. The government spending is doing the exact reverse, reducing the national debt. It is not inflationary, A. B, uh, we don't want to reduce the um, uh, increase in jobs, which we're very proud of. This president breaking records, his historic numbers of jobs created in the first year of his term in office, and a lot of it traced to the, uh, the uh, American Recovery Act. Uh, but yeah, it's it's we're paying very close attention to it. But this starts with Putin because global inflation for reasons beyond the gas the gas price global inflation is something that we have to deal with globally but we have our responsibility to deal with it at home and we have legislation that does just that by increasing supply uh, and uh, again creating jobs in a way that is not adding to inflation Mr. Thank you. <laughs>